<laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Lord Bishop, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished guests and uh, friends all, um, it is a great privilege and pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you to this year's Isaiah Berlin Annual Lecture at Hampstead Synagogue. Um, just a brief word about the setting that we're in and uh, the history of the lecture. Uh, Sir Isaiah's uh, parents joined our synagogue in the 1920s, and Sir Isaiah was a member of our synagogue for many years. Uh, when he died, uh, we held a, a very memorable uh, memorial service for him uh, in our beautiful synagogue chamber next uh, door, which some of you will have seen. But we wanted to establish a more permanent uh, memorial, uh, and one which would be in the spirit of Sir Isaiah's intellectual interests. And so we approached Lady Berlin uh, and the Berlin family, um, who uh, were very kind in consenting uh, to us setting up this uh, annual lecture. And the result has been uh, 20 uh, previous wonderful lectures uh, before uh, this evening. The very first was given uh, by um, the late uh, Lord Chief Rabbi Sachs, Zichron Olivechah, blessed memory, and it's wonderful to uh, see Lady Elaine and Gila here. Uh, and um, that we have had a wonderful uh, 20 years tonight, 21st annual lecture, meaning that if this lecture were being given in the United States of America, we could serve alcohol. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, our warm thanks, as always, to uh, Peter Halben, uh, Sir Isaiah's stepson, and all the family for their wonderful ongoing support and hard work uh, for this evening. Um, the uh, Hampstead Synagogue in which we're holding the lecture is part of the United Synagogue, and we warmly welcome United Synagogue President Michael Goldstein here with us uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, as, as well as being uh, a member of United Synagogue, a uh, core function of which uh, is or most naturally associated with worship, we pride ourselves at Hampstead on not just being a place of worship, but a place which uh, tries to be a venue for uh, high quality educational and cultural events uh, such as this evening. Uh, Zaki Cooper, who is uh, sitting uh, on my left, um, has uh, been absolutely indispensable uh, to securing a wonderful uh, series of lecturers for two decades uh, and in handling a great deal of the detail. Uh, and Zaki, as always, our deep thanks goes to you for everything you've done. <laughs> Paradoxically, the further we get away from Sir Isaiah's passing, and the more that the number of the uh, which annual lecture it is increases, the lecture seems to become more and more important as the values which Sir Isaiah championed um, seem to take on ever more resonance and importance in our troubled world. Uh, so tonight uh, we are very privileged to have uh, Sir Anthony Selden uh, with us, uh, and his wonderful reputation goes before him. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to hand over now to Zaki Cooper to introduce him. Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sir Anthony Selden to deliver the 21st Isaiah Berlin Lecture and I would like to welcome him and his family here this evening. I've been fortunate to know Anthony for over 10 years and even more fortunate to count him as a friend and mentor. When telling people about the lecture, I lost count of the number who said, I'm a fan of Anthony's, I adore Anthony, we love Anthony, or words to that effect. And I reflected on why that's the case. I think it's because he is uh, someone who is not only one of our leading educationalists, authors and public intellectuals, but he is also a change maker extraordinaire. He is someone who makes an outsized positive difference and inspires so many others to do the same. On any given day, you may hear him on the radio, read him in the press, find out about his next book, 
or learn of a transformational project he is spearheading, and that's just before breakfast. Anthony is head of Epsom College after over 20 years as a legendary headmaster at Brighton College and Wellington College. He then went on to be vice chancellor of the University of Buckingham. He is author or editor of over 40 books on contemporary history, politics, and education, including biographies of every prime minister from Margaret Thatcher to Boris Johnson. He is honorary historical advisor to 10 Downing Street. Now, five years ago, when Gordon Brown delivered this lecture, we had a bumper crowd, as you'd expect. One of the attendees was a certain Sir Keir Starmer. Given that the topic this evening will address the challenges facing the next PM, and we've already had the potential next PM in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, look around you as you could be sitting amongst the future leader of the country. One further thing to mention is Anthony's family connection to this synagogue. Joanna Toomey was married for 34 years and her family, the Pap Papworths, were members of this community. His father-in-law, Morris Papworth, a celebrated doctor and author, was for many years a loyal member. We are delighted that Anthony has remarried and his wife, La Lady Sarah Selden, is with us along with other family members. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Anthony to deliver this year's lecture. Has the job of Prime Minister become impossible? Can the next PM possibly succeed? Anthony, over to you. Well, thank you, Zaki, and uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Lords, Ladies, and uh, Bishops, and others, uh, welcome, and any future Prime Ministers. <laughs> the British Prime Minister is not working. Now, this matters. It matters a great deal. The office of Prime Minister is the longest enduring leader's office anywhere in the world. The title and the job have been copied by many other governments abroad. Yet the office is often working better abroad than in the UK. Since the office was established in April 1721, there have been just nine agenda-changing prime ministers out of 57. Only nine who made the weather, changed the agenda, changed history, and left the country and the union stronger with Britain enhanced in its position in the world. Their successors either tried to be like them or consciously unlike them, but none could escape the long shadow of those nine. Just nine out of 57. Over half British Prime Ministers since 1721, that's uh, nearly 30, achieved little that endured. What on earth is going on? Isaiah Berlin was born and died under two prime ministers, each epitomising his two different concepts of liberty. Soon after, Liberal Prime Minister Asquith moved into Downing Street, Berlin was born and he died shortly after Tony Blair became prime minister. What finesse. He would have shocked... He would have been shocked, though, by the dearth of high-quality prime ministerial performance over his lifetime. Shocked, but not perhaps totally surprised, for one who lived through Bolshevik Russia and observed Nazi Germany. He'd seen it all. As the great chief rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, reminded us in the inaugural lecture in this illustrious series 21 years ago, Isaiah Berlin was the closest Britain had to a sage. I like that. Jonathan Sachs, who presided, as we heard, in the synagogue over the funeral and memorial services of Berlin, was the closest himself that Britain had to Berlin's successor as national sage. Neat. So, has the office of PM become impossible to succeed in? Are the wrong people stepping up to be Prime Minister? Is their preparation for this ultimate challenge inadequate? Or are there 
inherent inadequacies in the powers of the office and weaknesses in the support that they have at the centre. Does that explain it? Tonight, we're going to be looking at why it matters that the office performs effectively and why it matters now in particular. We will look at which prime ministers have been most effective for over 300 years and why. And finally, we're going to look at how the system can be adapted to ensure that whoever wins in late 2024, if that's when it comes, will be in a position to do what needs to be done. One, why it matters that the PM performs. When Robert Walpole became Prime Minister in 1721, he was de jure and de facto the monarch's subordinate. The office nearly didn't survive the first change of monarch after six years to George II in 1727. Indeed, it took many years for the office of Prime Minister to become firmly established. There was at the time no cabinet, no collective responsibility, no political parties, barely any central government, and no staff for the PM outside the Treasury. Indeed, the term Prime Minister was initially a term of abuse and was not in common usage till the late 19th century and not till the early 20th century that it appeared in official documents. So what happened? Well, the incapacity of George III in the early 19th century and the increasing detachment of Queen Victoria throughout her long reign meant that by the time Edward VII succeeded to the throne in 1901, the Prime Minister was the undisputed font of power in Britain. Then and now, if the Prime Minister is not leading his team and driving forward change, the country does not work. There is a hole at the very centre of British politics that no one else can fill. Not cabinet, not party, not local government. Thank you for reminding me. We have some slides. <laughs> and, and which might work um, if we... Um, uh, uh, and um, we could, um, let's just see there. I can always do them there, can't I? Would that work? There we are. Um, there he is as a uh, young man under the time of Asquith, and there he is uh, at the end of his life, dying under uh, six months into Tony Blair's time in government. Um, and we're going to come on to those in a moment. Why um, does it matter? Um, secondly, why does it matter now? Why does the position of the Prime Minister, the, the, the lack of leadership, particularly matter now? So Britain is coming to the close of its sixth period of single-party dominance since 1945. The Tories have been in power uh, for 14 years. Each, every one of those earlier five periods, Labour after 1945, Conservatives after 51, Labour after 64, Conservatives after 79, and Labour after 97 were conspicuously more successful. The Conservative record since 2010 has, by any standards, been baleful. <laughs> Why? How? The economic record has been poor, with growth, productivity, standards of living stuck. Britain is in recession. The seven chancellors since 2010 followed contradictory policies, exacerbated by the self-inflicted goals of Brexit, the response to COVID, the trust dash for growth, and discord between the PM and the chancellor, particularly between 2016 to 2022. After 14 years of inconsistent foreign, defence and international development policy, Britain's stock abroad and ability to defend itself has fallen. The union is weaker. Health, education, transport, housing and social care are in crisis. The four apocalyptic horses of climate change, AI, epidemic preparation and mental health, particularly amongst young people, all inadequately addressed. Health, 
educational and regional inequalities have grown. Recorded crime figures are at a 20-year high. NHS waiting lists and housing shortages are through the roof. Now, these facts come from a book which I've edited that Peter Kellner is one of the contributors. Peter Kellner is in the audience here today by some of Britain's leading academics and experts. This is not a anti-Tory book. It is simply what the best opinion in the country thinks about the last 14 years. With no longer the European Union to blame, the Conservative right has looked for other culprits and attacked and degraded the civil service, the BBC, the police, universities, the, judici the judiciary, and more. All of them certainly needed reform, but none were reformed by this government. No Conservative government in history, in history, have so persistently attacked the institutions <coughs> of the British state. This government made Brexit happen, but they didn't make Brexit happen. For sure, in the coming election, we will hear much about 14 wasted years, picking up on the theme of 13 wasted years from 1951 to 64 that Peter Kellner has written about, from those with political points to make. Like Berlin, I prefer the judgment of history. We haven't yet woken up to realise quite how powerless the verdict of history is going to be, how bleak the verdict will be on the last 14 years. So, we need a top-tier Prime Minister after the general election to restore national morale, a sense of purpose and confidence in the public realm. How did this collapse in performance since 2010 happen? Four explanations. One, lack of consistent sense of purpose and direction. The government since 2010 didn't know consistently what they were trying to do and they did not build on each other. Rule one of leadership. Announce a clear and realistic plan and stick to it relentlessly. Second, churn. It takes time for office holders to master their brief and introduce effective action. What did we have? Five prime ministers, seven chancellors, nine business secretaries, 10 education secretaries, not one of whom knows, knew what the word education meant, by the way, and I know because I asked each of them, and 13 <laughs> culture secretaries. That says it all. Rule two of leadership, appoint good people and stick with them. Endless churn in top positions came in Whitehall too. Many of the best quitting early, no longer in the civil service, and no less than five cabinet secretaries. From the moment the cabinet office was, was created in December 1916 by Lloyd George until 2010, cabinet secretaries at the apex of Whitehall served on average nine years. But since 2010, it's been three years and included one appointed purely at the instigation of the prime minister's puppet master lieutenant, Dominic Cummings. Why? For his own personal ends. That's deeply troubling. But most were too cowed to protest at what happened. Third, poor ministerial quality. Where were the ministers to match Clement Atlas, Ernest Bevin, Herbert Morrison, Stafford Cripps, Nye Bevan, Hugh Dalton, Hugh Gateskill? Or Harold Wilson's Dennis Healy, Roy Jenkins, Tony Crossland, James Callaghan. Since 2010, over 200 have served as ministers. Very few appear to have learned or even wanted to learn on the job. They do listen to their know-nothing, often tribal, always, special advisers. Rule three of leadership, appoint the best people beneath you. Finally, the quality of the prime ministers. They included one who had done well as Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. But he didn't bring the same team into Downing Street who'd helped steer him through City Hall. 
rule four of leadership, without the right leader at the top, no one stands a chance. Nothing so sums up, I believe, the moral destitution of today's Conservative Party and that some of its senior figures think that the answer to their problems lie in bringing back Boris Johnson. So I would place Boris Johnson, and I think it's a tragedy because I think he did have qualities, I'd place him at the bottom of the 57, but who are the best prime ministers and why? Three, the second 11, and this is where we're going to come back to the slides if they're going to be working. So, history lesson, but important. It's important, history matters. Berlin knew that. Henry Pelham, from 1743, opens the batting for the Downing Street second 11. <laughs> He brought stability after Jacobite uprising in 1745, with his 11 years in office. He was the eighth longest serving prime minister in a length between Blair and Thatcher in years. And he cemented the position after Walpole's departure. Then William Pitt, Lord Chatham, was renowned for his leadership on the world stage and the first genuinely popular politician across Britain. That mattered. But his glory days were earlier, before he came into the top job, and he, which he didn't blossom when he did become Prime Minister after 1766. Liverpool steered the country through the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the grave unrest that followed it, and was the first to make the job of Prime Minister coordinating government departments into that coordinating role. But he resisted, rather than channel, the popular and intellectual current sweeping across Britain and Europe. Earl Grey presided over the final passing of the Great Reform Act of uh, 1832 and the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, but three years in office was too brief for him to cast off in his own particular direction. Disraeli was, like Chatham, past his best when he became Prime Minister. As Chancellor, he'd pushed through the 1867, that's the second Great Reform Act, uh, but when he was Prime Minister, he didn't do nearly as much, he, some social legislation, but he was already ailing, and he died in 1881, the year after he gave up Downing Street. Asquith advanced the social policy agenda, above all with the 1911 National Assurance Act, which paved the way for the welfare state, but he failed to get ahead of the brewing problems. What were they? War-ready Germany militant trade unionism, rebellious Ireland, and protesting suffragettes. Stanley Baldwin from 1924 provided reassurance and stability for the country in the volatile interwar years. He helped induct Labour into parliamentary democracy while marginalising extremism on the left and indeed the right. And he saw the country through the abdication crisis of 1936. No mean achievements but he was not a commanding leader shaping the agenda, either at home or abroad. Macmillan, from 1957, the last to serve in the First World War, was the first television prime minister. He promoted decolonisation, and he made the first attempt to join the European community. But he was the beneficiary of, rather than the inspirer of economic growth. And he failed to address Britain's long-standing economic problems. Harold Wilson, after 1964, oversaw liberal measures under Home Secretary Roy Jenkins, started the Open University, but was too distracted by managing his own party and cabinet to provide the consistent and steady lead for the country. And he failed to ignite the economic regeneration or the white heat of technological revolution that he'd promised. Ted Heath had one achievement and one alone, taking the country into the European uh, community in 1973 after the two previous failed attempts. Few prime ministers have been more hyperactive on the domestic front. Few have seen their agenda collapse so quickly and utterly after he fell. Now, Tony Blair is the figure many think should be in the top tier and not in the second 11 league. And I have an active discussion with Andrew Adonis his official biographer, who thinks that he should be. Maybe he's right. The elite group, to me, though, are not measured by the number of general elections that they win, but what actually they do with the 
power and the opportunities that they have. For all Blair's many achievements, the Good Friday Agreement, constitutional reform, the minimum wage, public sector, public service reform, he was unable to find an enduring solution to Britain's chronically troubled problem with the EU or to reimagine public services in the way that he had led us perhaps to believe. While his involvement in Iraq, uh, the invasion in 2003, did nothing to enhance Britain's standing in the world. Many highly able leaders, I think, like John Major and Gordon Brown, miss even this second rank because of the unfavorable circumstances they faced when they came to power. Great PMs are rarely tail end Charlies. Spence, Spencer Percival also would have made that second 11 rank, I think, had he not been assassinated in 18. 12, after three years, he was set to become most promising. Four, the first 11. Which prime ministers then do make it to this top tier? A similar list can be, I think, given to US presidents. And that might include, well, who? We can all have our own list, can't we? To me, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, F.D. Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, L.B. Johnson, and Ronald Reagan. Or among German chancellors, a whole swathe of chancellors from Konrad Adenauer to Angela Merkel. Identifying such a top performer list is more than a parlor game. It helps us to identify generic factors that make for that level of success. It's instructive to do so. So, who makes the first 11? In fact, it's the first nine. Uh, well, first up, the poser and arch rascal Robert Walpole, <laughs> who defined the job of PM by dint of his range of hyperactivity in it and longevity in office, 21 years still the longest. His moving into the rickety and cranky 10 Downing Street in 1735 helped also define what the modern office is, which is so utterly involved with that street. That was before the, uh, the houses on your left uh, were knocked down to make way for George Gilbert Scott's foreign office, and the houses at the end that contained the colonial office and the then foreign office were burnt down. But just, just look, at the, look, look at that, look at that painting of Walpole. Fabulously rich, no one quite knew how. Uh, look at that crown. I mean, what's he trying to do? What, what is he trying to prove there? Exactly. And, uh, and next up, another giant, Pitt the Younger. Um, so uh, the man who stepped up when Britain needed a brilliant operator to modernise the office, the financial system, Britain's diplomacy, and upstep the inordinately young 24-year-old William Pitt the Younger, a genius financially, administratively, and diplomatically. His 18 years, the second longest in history. He cemented the office of prime minister. It was still fragile when he came to power, and he died at age 46, still younger than the vast majority of prime ministers when they were first appointed. Next up. Robert Peel, the first Prime Minister after the 1932, 1832 Reform Act to head a modern political party, the creator, as much as anybody, of the Conservative Party. He split the office of PM off from the Treasury, the Kent Treasury at the end, which is now the Cabinet Office, at the end of Downing Street, was where he had his office conveniently by. And that sculpted the modern office while also denuding uh, the Prime Minister of much of the power he was the first Prime Minister able to crisscross by railway the nation, shrinking the size of the state and the ability to get uniform news and time across the nation. But he also split his party in repealing the Corn Laws, consigning it to be out of power effectively for 28 years. Next up, another rascal, Palmerston. Immersed himself in foreign policy for nearly 50 years before becoming extraordinarily, 50 years, before he even became Prime Minister in 1855. But he was Minister for War in 1808 uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. 
More than any figure, this man was responsible for Britain's emergence as the global superpower in the mid-19th century, while also managing to be the most popular and well-known prime minister in the, in the entire century. Um, also interesting, that's the first photograph of the prime minister. Look at how unsophisticated his uh, know-how of using the um, uh, ph photograph in terms of his own image compared to this next man, surprisingly, perhaps, who knew exactly the image he wanted to create. As Palmerston extended Britain's reach across the world, four-time PM William Gladstone extended the reach of the Prime Minister across the domestic life of the nation, creating the modern education system and the civil service. By the time he stood down in 1894, the office of Prime Minister had become the undisputed head uh, across the country, offering a programme on which the electorate could choose at a general election, a sense of a mandate uh, offering the electorate. By the end of the 19th century, then, the Prime Minister, he fell in 1894, had the ambition, if not yet the apparatus, to be at the centre, at the centre, to provide that powerhouse to the entire nation, a much smaller um, army behind him than the monarch still had. So it was his fellow Liberal, Lloyd George, who filled the gap when he created the modern Prime Minister's office with the Cabinet Secretariat and Cabinet Office in December 1916, the month after the end of the disastrous Somme battle. Not since Peel, Peel had dispensed with the Treasury had a Prime Minister again so much firepower at his personal disposal. Lloyd George was a giant who dominated British politics for 20 years, oversaw the division of Ireland, the last two years of the First World War, and the reshaping of Europe and the wider world at the Treaty of Versailles after it. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister who Berlin knew best, Isaiah Berlin knew best. Unlike Gladstone and Lloyd George Berlin wrote of him, Churchill does not reflect the contemporary social or moral world. Rather, he creates his own, an image of such power it becomes the reality and alters the external world by being imposed by him on it with irresistible force. Wondrously put. The admiration between Isaiah Berlin and Winston Churchill was, was mutual. The famous story that you'll all know of Churchill conversing with Irving Berlin at lunch in February 1944, believing he was talking to Isaiah, <laughs> whose regular reports from the Washington Embassy he'd admired, led to puzzlement from Churchill when he found his guest talking to him about the merits of the song White Christmas, not quite what, <laughs> what he had expected. Churchill, regularly voted top British Prime Minister in surveys, was the supreme leader of Britain at his greatest peril in the entire 303 years of the Premiership. Britain's standing was incomparably higher in 1945 after he was defeated by Labour than it had been when he'd taken over in May 1940. Now, the next Prime Minister is unusual, and he's the only one of the top tier to follow directly after another, which makes his achievement all the greater. One of the more technically, most technically skillful incumbents of the office in history, he provided the most policy heavy administration in history, one of them. Pivoting Britain towards the United States, not the Soviet Union, the creation of NATO in 1949, creation of the welfare state, giving independence to India and Pakistan, greenlighting the atomic bomb in 1946, rebuilding the economy after the disastrous financial inheritance in 1945. So top-tier prime ministers, they make history. They don't succumb to it or complain about their legacies. Thatcher was equally remarkably adept at the job driving domestic and foreign policy, even with a minuscule team at number 10, exploding the myth that prime ministerial failure can be blamed on number 10 being too small or the alleged poor quality of the advice from the miserable civil service. Attlee and Thatcher had tiny number 10s. All these top tier were giants who cast shadow over their successors. Today's Conservative Party still cannot free itself from the shadow of Thatcher. 
Indeed, homage to her is almost the only ingredient that binds the party together. Five, what explains PM's success? Some factors lie beyond the grasp of these prime ministers, some within it. Character matters. It is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for being a top tier or a second tier prime minister. So we might, we're going to, we're going to uh, look at the character traits. And there, um, there are 11. Moral seriousness is uh, essential, epitomised by Gladstone. Not all our top tier prime ministers, frankly, were moral personally. We might highlight Walpole, Palmerston, Lloyd George as not. But all possessed an intense moral seriousness about the work in front of them. An iron will is essential. A relentless self-belief while also remaining open to critical opinions. Pitt the Younger possessed iron or even still steel willpower in fourth rail bridge dimensions. Next, the top tier need to be statesmen or stateswomen appealing beyond their tribal base to the whole nation. Few epitomise that better than Peel, who lost his job and broke his party over repealing the Corn Laws. Next, they need to be capable of profound hard work and dedication to duty. Thatcher exemplifies this, never more so than on 12th of October 1984, when she appeared spotless and dignified at the Conservative Party conference, having been up all night after the Grand Hotel bomb. There she is. They must be excellent communicators of their strategy and their message on paper or in speech or on both. We will never know how remarkable an orator Pitt the Younger was in the age of great orators, including his arch rival Charles James Fox, because sadly their speeches were unrecorded in Parliament till the 19th century. But none were better orators in the last 150 years than that man, Lloyd George. The strain on the Prime Minister is intolerable, and even, ooh, even, temperaments, are, um, uh, even temperaments are absolutely vital. None managed their coup better than Clement Attlee, as befits the penultimate man to be evacuated from Suvla Bay at the end of the disastrous Gallipoli campaign on 20th December 1915. An extraordinary achievement. He was an extraordinary man. They need to have, um, the, they need to have uh, strong spouses, strong core relationships, because it's the loneliest job in the whole country, and they need to have that faculty. We remember Clementine telling Churchill in World War II that he has to stop being unpleasant to his staff. There is a danger, Winston, of, you, of your being generally disliked by your colleagues and subordinates because of your rough, sarcastic, and overbearing manner. Dennis Thatcher was the perfect foil to Thatcher. Seven of our top tier were supported by their wives, one by her husband, and one William Pitt the Younger, by his mother, Hester, wife of Pitt the Elder. The top tier needed to be shrewd judges of character and talent. And, um, oh, there we are. Um, that's Dennis. And uh, uh, they need to be shrewd judges and equally shrewd dismissers, as well as appointers. All nine had strong groups around them, none more so than Attlee, from left to right, I don't need to tell you. Uh, Bevin, Bevan, Morrison and Dalton. Supreme skills at managing cabinet and the media are essential. None more accomplished at it than Palmerston. Part of that skill is keeping a dignified distance from the media, which many prime ministers have neglected to do. And finally, and least important, because great prime ministers make their own, comes luck. Had Lloyd George succumbed to Spanish flu when he fell ill at Manchester Town Hall in September 1918, and for several years he was on the verge of death, it's not impossible that Churchill would have succeeded him then. Churchill in 1918 would have been a disaster. In May 1940, he was ready. But these 11 traits only take us so far in understanding what makes for a great prime minister. Some factors are outside their control, or mostly so. Between the elections of 1721 and 
2019, there were 20 landslides. Churchill was the only top-tier Prime Minister not to come, of the nine, not to come to power on the back of one. Now, that's telling. By winning a, like, a landslide so vital for the Prime Minister to gain command over Parliament and party to facilitate decisive action, that does not of itself guarantee being in the top tier. Campbell Bannerman won a landslide in 1906, Ramsay MacDonald in 1931, Harold Wilson in 1966. They won landslides. Prime Ministers then, and that is the... Um, there, in red, you can see the iconic top-tier uh, prime ministers uh, winning their landslides. Length of experience matters um, because it takes time for them to learn their craft. Eight of the nine were in Parliament for more than 20 years, you'll see, um, before they first became prime minister. The exception, of course, was Pitt the Younger, who would have had to become an MP when he was four to have qualified <laughs> for 20 years' apprenticeship. Uh, they need to have very clear agendas and they've got to be achievable agendas. They can be thrust upon them, as was the case with war prime ministers Pitt the Younger, Lloyd George and Churchill, or worked out methodically before Downing Street, as was the case with Gladstone, Attlee and Satcher. And there are the, those agendas there. And then the economy should ideally be growing, providing the money to enable the spending. That's going to be a significant problem for whoever wins in 2024. What is thus remarkable about Lloyd George and Attlee is that, as the graphs reveal, you can see there the iconic top-tier prime ministers all on a rising tide. What's remarkable about them is that they inherited war-blighted economies. Finally, all the top-tier prime ministers have come to office at moments of great historical importance. But they've been able to turn wars, turn famines, turn economic downturns, turn epidemics to their advantage. Lord North, Prime Minister during the time of the American War of Independence, was unable to do this. Neither was Neville Chamberlain in the late 1930s, though he possessed many of the attributes of a great Prime Minister. The coincidence of great events with great Prime Ministers in British history, and indeed American presidential history, begs the question, do great leaders make history, or does history make great leaders? Berlin had thoughts about this. Six, a short meditation on history. Berlin locked horns with the Marxist historian E.H. Carr, who argued for impersonal forces determining history. In its place, Berlin stressed the importance of individual and human agency in effecting change. He believed that individual prime ministers can make a difference. And that's, I believe that too. But he did not approve of their lack of knowledge of history. He railed in the 1960s against the all-pervasive ignorance of history, berating this generation for hating history. Has the human race developed in the 60 years since he said that? I have to tell you that most prime ministers in the last few years have known little history. Most cabinet ministers know little history. Most officials know little history. Berlin saw how much history matters. It's now 40 years since Peter Hennessy and I established the Institute of Contemporary British History to encourage the objective study of recent history. Ten years ago, when the then cabinet secretary, Jeremy Hayward, was still alive in an office, we initiated a series of regular history talks in number 10 by authors and the makers of recent history. The staff who came loved them. The prime ministers often were unable. Every Whitehall department, not least the cabinet office, should have a chief historian to remind ministers of historical precedent. As chair of the National Archive Trust, I know how much documents matter, but documents are not being created as much today or used as much as they should. Hence the campaign to launch the Museum of the British Prime Minister, all part of the drive for history to be taken seriously. Museum of the British Prime Minister. It has to happen. Berlin, I'm sure, would have approved. Prime Ministers say and they do such silly things. If they had more understanding of historical precedent and their own historic opportunity in office, they might avoid such follies. Seven, reasons why the job is becoming impossible. Since the end of the First World War 105 years ago, 
No Prime Minister has left at a moment entirely of their own choosing or with their agenda complete. So why has life become more dis difficult, impossible even, for the Prime Minister of late? First, party management. In Britain and abroad, parties have become more difficult, more argumentative. As, uh, as Tim Bale, another author in that book, identified, populist radical right insurgencies challenge leadership and they've often found it difficult to respond across Europe, as in Britain. The challenge for the right, whether it was the referendum party for Major, UKIP for Cameron, and now reform for, Su for Sunak. It's much easier to become Prime Minister if your party is behaving. Second, short-termism. Prime Ministers very rapidly lose their perspective, sense of purpose and composure and strategy, once in number 10. The weekly audience with the monarch reminds them of the dignity and responsibility of office, of the long term, of the sense of service. The special advisers, in contrast, who greet them once they come back into number 10, too often drag them down with short-term political tasks. If they don't, the 24 news, news cycle does. The morning and evening meetings in the Prime Minister's study too often descend into short-term knee-jerk reactions. What is it? Oh, it's a by-election, or it's an MP with his hand in the till, or somewhere even worse, or shooting their mouths off about something, or an irascible thunder, or a disobliging story in the press. All these take the attention of the Prime Minister, and before long, he or she has totally forgotten what the purpose was until of their premiership, until near the end, when they start thinking of legacy, earning an income, and their memoirs. <laughs> PMs forget that they have a choice, what they attend to. To lead is to choose. Third, perpetual struggles with the Treasury. In 1964, Wilson tried to settle it by setting up a new body, the Department of Economic Affairs. That failed. Thatcher battled with her Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, towards the end. Major with Norman Lamont, Blair with Gordon Brown, Brown with Alistair Darling, Theresa May with Philip Hammond, Johnson with Sunak. Liz Truss then sacked Quasi Quateng. Why? For the sin of too loyally carrying out her policies. <laughs> <laughs> Every would-be Prime Minister announces that their relationship with their Chancellor will, of course, be different. As we hear now from Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves, but will it? Once they're in their new positions with their new teams, the world looks very different. New imperatives take over. Eight, five Labour problems and five solutions. Labour has had 31 years in power in their history, but only 19 of these years has had a working majority, 1945 to 50, 66 to 70, and 97 to 2010. So over half of them under just one Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Labour, let's be honest, is likely to win the coming general election, but it is as yet far from certain that it will win with a decent working majority. That's problem one for the next Labour Prime Minister. Jeremy Corbyn ceased to be leader in 2020, but his followers have not gone away for all their distancing under Starmer. If and when Starmer is unable to achieve expected momentum, they will rise up again and challenge him. His cabinet ministers will be jockeying for power, jockeying for money, jockeying to succeed him. That's problem two. The public realm is broken, the backlog severe, repairs beyond urgent, the four long-term horses of the apocalypse under-attended, Lack of money, weakness of the economy, the downsides of Brexit barely beginning to be felt, public expectations very high, the ability to deliver less, much less. Problem three. Starmer, for all his strengths, lacks qualities possessed by his three Labour predecessors who knocked out the Conservatives to win majorities. He lacks the experience of 20 years of leading the party and being de facto Deputy Prime Minister of Clement Attlee. He lacks the campaigning genius of Harold Wilson or the giant charisma at home and abroad of Tony Blair. That's problem four. With Keir Starmer, where is the magic? Where is the music? Where is the poetry? But even if he does rule in prose and sings plain song, he can still become exactly the prime minister the country needs to heal and shape it over the next 10 to 15 years. 
He will be 62 if he wins, I think. The oldest prime minister since Wilson left number 10 for Callaghan in 1976, saying that he was quitting to make way for an older man. <laughs> Starmer's age and experience are positives after too many young prime ministers. He will be 16 years older than Pitt was when he died, but six years younger than Attlee in 1945, and 20 years younger than Biden, if re-elected. Not certain that's a recommendation. <laughs> so what should Keir Starmer do if he becomes Labour's seventh prime minister? One, he needs to discover a portmanteau theme far more clearly, something stemming from deep inner beliefs. All, every single nine, a gender-changing changing prime minister had such a theme, something indivisible about them in their own different ways. He needs to be more ambitious in his planning for office. The education, health and culture agendas, for example, at present are lamentably under-ambitious. Three, be brave about the EU and stop pussyfooting about. Apart from the risk of offending the right-wing press still mystically attached to Brexit, what possible reason can he not have for opening conversations on re-entry to the single market and customs union? <coughs> Four, implement in full the recommendations that we propose in the Institute for Government's Commission, which a number of you in the room have helped on, uh, on the centre for a smaller, stronger, smarter centre and a freshly empowered Prime Minister working in lockstep with the Chancellor. Finally, bring back the brightest and best into Whitehall and specifically number 10 and have the broadest possible talent coming into Cabinet to run the departments with properly costed five-year plans. He could learn too from his six Labour predecessors, from MacDonald, to move smartly as no one knows what disasters might strike and when. From Attlee to be massively ambitious for the first term. From Wilson, don't lose sight like Wilson did of the big picture. From Callaghan, keep your cabinet on side. From Blair, go for the big tent, bring everyone on board with you and banish tribalism. From Brown, don't be afraid to be serious. So find your Jonathan Powell, your Angie Hunter, your Peter Mandelson, your Jonathan Powell. Well, you can find Peter Mandelson very easily in the front row. <laughs> don't, worry about, don't worry about charisma. Attlee lacked it and was the best Labour Prime Minister in history. Do all this. And it will show the office is not impossible, merely the way that the incumbents have chosen to conduct themselves in it. It is nearly 35 years since Britain has had a landmark prime minister. That's too long. One is long overdue, badly overdue.